Um, I'm concerned about where we're going with policing in this country. I have had many nights where I've stayed up tossing and turning, trying to think about how we can move forward. There was a time in my life where I thought it was about defunding the police and rethinking the police. After spending time with the work of Dr. Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, uh, the work of Dr. Angela Davis, the recent work of Miriam Kaba, and in conversation with Kobe Flowers, one of our panelists, I am moving into the abolish the police stance. And I wanna explore that today. And so I'm excited to have an opportunity for me to think out loud about where I sit with this and to be in conversation with my esteemed colleagues to help us figure out how how can we rethink or, or unthink, according to Kobe Flowers, policing in black and brown communities? I'm joined today by Reverend Scott Adams, the Assistant Director of Campus Ministry here at Loyola University, Maryland, and the Senior Pastor of Heritage United Church of Christ. Reverend Adams, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Absolutely. I'm also joined by Dr. Nishan Battle. She's an associate professor of criminal justice at Virginia State University and the author of Black Girlhood, Punishment and Resistance, Reimagining Justice for Black Girls in Virginia. And may I say, now that we're thinking about Micaiah Bryant, I am delighted to have you on the panel, Dr. Battle, to help us to understand what's happening with Black girls and women. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm also joined by Kobe Flowers, who you heard me mention earlier. Uh, he is a partner with Brown, Goldstein, and Levy. Uh, he has been prosecuting police officers probably longer than I've been around, so I don't date myself. Uh, but for the last 20 years or so, he's been a civil rights attorney. He's one of the few civil rights attorneys who've ever prosecuted police officers uh, for police brutality. And so he's here to help us think about what it should look like going forward. Mr. Flowers, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Kev. And finally, I'm joined by Adam Jackson, who's based right here in Baltimore City. He's the CEO of Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, uh, but he's been talking a lot about the importance of building Black institutions. Mr. Jackson, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. So I want to start with you um, before we kind of get into this kind of intellectual discussion. Can you just help us to frame this moment and maybe why we shouldn't be, you know, dancing in the streets like we've arrived? Like, what does this mean for us? So kind of just the, in context, first off, peace and blessings to everybody. Uh, glad to be in the conversation today. Peace and blessings to the viewers, especially if there's any young people watching. Uh, the fact that you're a part of this discussion today is extremely important. And I hope that uh, some of the information that uh, myself and uh, uh, folks on the panel today share is helpful in your own growth and development and doing a lot of work for your community. Um, but I, what I will say, uh, Dr. K, you know, when uh, the verdict was announced, uh, was it two days ago now, uh, you know, every, you know, Black people had a range of reactions. Black people had uh, a range of like extreme joy, you know, re rejoicing in the streets, like we finally got one. You know, there were some black people that were ambivalent that were like, you know, eh. and other people that were on the other end of the spectrum that were cynical that were like, yeah, just because one goes to one gets convicted doesn't mean it's going to get sentenced right doesn't mean that other black other police officers are going to be caught or sentenced for, you know, uh, their crimes against our community. And my thing is, any one of those reactions is not only to be expected, it's tremendously normal, considering all the experiences that black people have had in this country. And I think that oftentimes what happens is we, we're moving from moment to moment. You know, social media has created an environment and a context where we're, we're bombarded with images every day of, you know, anti-Blackness, anti you know, Black people being under the foot, under the boot, and under and literally knees on the necks of our community. And so these are these types of images cause internalized anti-Blackness, internalized inferiority. And when you're bombarded with those kinds of images all the time, you internalize a feeling of hopelessness and despair that becomes difficult to overcome if that's what you consume and if that's what you see as the only end game in this country. And so to, your, uh, to what you said earlier about building institutions, I think a lot of our community, we're not grounded. We're not grounded in what's necessary for us to actually achieve the things that we need to achieve. And in this country, particularly as it relates to police brutality and policing, a lot of the things that we want to address uh, as it relates to police officers and, police and law enforcement has to do with our advocacy at the local and the state level. And a lot of people, particularly, you know, people who are just not familiar with politics, you know, a lot of us think that it's Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's responsibility to pass legislation and encourage U.S. Congress to pass legislation 
that will end this, you know, epidemic of violence in our community. And what I want the viewers to understand is that these issues are inherently local. They're inherently at the grassroots level. And that the only way any of these issues are going to be transformed is that we organize at the state and local level to build types of infrastructure that will hold policing account police accountable. Um, one example I can give is uh, what happened during Maryland, the Maryland General Assembly this year. Uh, for people who are unfamiliar, the Maryland General Assembly is when the state legislators convene every between January and April, and they discuss laws and legislation that are going to pass. And uh, this year, police accountability was at the top of that list. And so the leadership of the Maryland General Assembly were debating about these issues pretty intensely and fiercely this year. And so one example of something that we could that we that we can do that we were advocating for was civilian oversight of the police. And so and every, and every sociological study, every data driven study and evidence based solution offered for police accountability says that civilians residents need to have oversight of the police, because what happens is there's a system and structure created where police are protected from being held accountable. And that is only done if you advocate it at the state and local level. And that's what legislators disagree with us about, is that the legislation that passed that repealed the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, a law that protects law enforcement and keeps that civilian oversight from happening. When that, when that was repealed, that particular point was the major issue around how, uh, about how police should be held accountable. And so that is an issue that can only be forwarded is if people like ourselves, you and me and other folks and other institutions go to Annapolis and advocate for ourselves. And that I think that people have to understand that that's the case. And that, you know, when you are trying to advocate for yourself in your community, you have to have local institutions and organizations and infrastructure that do that for you. And you can't expect others to do it for you. So that's how that's what I would frame it as. It's that it's not a matter of people's reaction. You know, people's reaction is short term, but it's a question of where our general thrust, energy, and overall perspective should be. And it should be on dismantling the infrastructure and building institutions that can be the alternatives to the plight we see in our community. Thank you. I want to come to you next, Kobe Flowers. Um, and I want to talk about police brutality, but I want to give a heads up to Dr. Battle because after I speak with Mr. Flowers, I'm going to come to you, Dr. Battle, to help us to frame why we should be saying their names. Like, what does that mean in the power of saying the names of the victims in this moment? Uh, so, Kobe, as an a lawyer, someone who's done civil rights advocacy, you said something I told you that has stayed with me when you said just sending one police officers to jail will not end police brutality. Can you speak about that and, and what it means for us going forward that one person is going to jail, but this just week alone, another person was shot, an unarmed person was shot by the police. And in the last month since the Chauvin trial, 75 unarmed people have been shot by the police in the last month. Well, Dr. K, um, let me answer that question first by um, uh, not taking credit for it, but, but really giving the credit to the person where I learned this from which was Angela Davis, right? Who um, is a prison abolitionist, not only a police abolitionist, but a prison abolitionist. And you've already um, you've kind of spoken about her work and Professor Ruth um, uh, Gilmore's um, work with Golden Gulag. Um, you know, so there have been black women prison abolitionists who have been fighting this fight for decades. And what we often don't do enough as our society is listen to what the black women have to say. Right. And so um, I, I tried to do that. Um, but then I also just learned by being a federal civil rights prosecutor who put people um, in cages. And then I realized if I go back to those police departments or uh, prisons, the same thing is happening. And we've got to ask ourselves why and what do we do really to solve the problem? Um, and just to realize that putting somebody in a cage really is not justice. Um, the Attorney General Keith Ellison got at a little bit of this when he did his, his press conference. Um, and I just want to remind folks kind of in the way that uh, my brother Adam Jackson has, has done um, that we've got to look at history and understand kind of how we got here. Um, We've got to try to figure out how we can all work together and figure out how we don't repeat what we've done. Um, and so let me just end by saying we've been putting police officers in cages as of 2021 
this year for at least 150 years. Mm -hmm. How has that worked for African Americans? In fact, the Justice Department, where I practiced, um, was started in 1870. In 1871, one of the most important statutes that the Justice Department prosecuted was the Ku Klux Klan Act passed in the Reconstruction era because the Ku Klux Klan and the police officers were one and the same. Mm. The civil rights um, laws that I use to uh, sue police officers um, comes from that 1871 Ku Klux Klan Act. That's what section 42 or, or, or title 42 United States Code 1983 comes from, comes all the way back 150 years ago from the Ku Klux Klan Act. My point is simple, is that we've been doing this and fighting this fight for so long, for 150 years, and yet we're still at the same place. Some of us are old enough, not you, Dr. K, but some of us are old enough to remember what happened with the Rodney King riot and then conviction of two police officers. And what happened in the wake of that is the same thing that's happening now with George Floyd. We talked about, hey, we've got to get statutes passed. We've got to reform the police department. Um, there was the Christopher Commission that came out to look at particularly the LAPD, but really um, law enforcement generally. And in the wake of the Rodney King riots and convictions of those two LAPD officers, right? We had the 1994 crime bill, which not, certainly added to mass incarceration, but one of the things that it did do was it allowed the Civil Rights Division, again, a place where I practice, to go ahead and put police departments under consent decrees like the one here in Baltimore. My point, so that's 30 years ago, okay? And, and again, can we really sit here and say, after Rodney King and everybody up in arms and everybody wanting to make change, can we really say that this is the change that we want? Mm. So that's why I raised this question of um, putting people in cages. Is that really justice? We've done this over and over again for 150 years. We just did it 30 years ago with Rodney King. Now is the time to, as the Washington Post says, reimagine what public safety looks like. As the ACLU says, um, to go, go ahead and uh, replace uh, the police department. So that's how I'd answer that question, Dr. Kerr. Forgive me for being long-winded. No, this is great. And I'm, I'm going to go to Dr. Battle, but Reverend Adams, stand by, because I'd like to talk about why people are crying in this moment. Like, why, is pe why are people seeing this as a moment of healing? Uh, Dr. Battle, I come to you. Um, Kobe Flowers just mentioned Rodney King. And for young people who may not be familiar, Rodney King from 1991, a person took video off of their balcony of Rodney King, who had been on a kind of a small speed chase with the police, pulled out of his car and beaten with batons. Uh, they believe they hit him anywhere from 53 to 56 times. They tasered him on his chest. He had burn marks on his chest, broke his arm. Um, and after that, and after we found that the police officers were not convicted, almost like we couldn't believe our own eyes, about what we saw, there was a, a huge riot, if you use the, the words of Dr. King, a language of the unheard in response to that. But, but in the courtroom, listening to the verdict, Dr. Battle, you had family members of Rodney King in the courtroom. Uh, the word is that there were family members of Emmett Till, you know, the 14-year-old boy who had been killed in 1955, they were in the courtroom. You had Breonna Taylor's boyfriend in the courtroom. Jesse Jackson flew in, Al Sharpton flew in. Like for a lot of black people, like this was the moment to say their names that justice for the family or accountability. And I want you to talk about the difference between accountability and justice for the family also meant maybe accountability for all the other black folks who never got their day in court or when they did, they did not see what happened with Derek Chauvin. So can you talk a bit about all of that and help us to understand the importance of it? So um, the, import, the importance, excuse me, of saying her name and saying their names is simply um, symbolic of recognizing their humanity. There are so many names that have never been mentioned in you know, um, as uh, Attorney Flowers was saying earlier, you know, this has been going on for centuries. And when I think about 
my historical work in examining the ways in which Black girls have been punished legally in the system, you notice that it continues to mirror um, in today's age exactly what it looked like as early as 1915 when the first um, female ever, um, uh, Virginia Christian, was executed in Virginia. Um, and she was a domestic worker. She was a teenager. She was only 16. However, social media continued to depict her and describe her as an adult woman. And mm -hmm. there is this concept, this, this topic that um, is called adultification. Mm -hmm. And that simply means that Black girls or, or anyone, but in this particular case, we're talking about Black girls are viewed older as their white counterpart. Mm -hmm. They're viewed as adult. Black girls are also blamed for their own victimization. Mm -hmm. And so when we begin to discuss reimagining what policing will look like in Black and Brown communities, I really um, draw from both Attorney Flowers and Adam Jackson in that we need to consider complete transformation, which can only occur through abolishing certain systems. And we can accomplish these things when we start at a grassroots level and start to realize that we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. We are the ones that can actually initiate true change. And so we really have to recognize the structural realities for people in many Black and Brown communities when we're um, thinking about reimagining what policing will look like. And so I reimagine economics um, being um, uh, distributed equit um, equitably and what that would look like and and what would a community look like if there were resources available, more role models, which William Julius Wilson spoke about years ago, you know, social buffers. What would that look like if we were not, meaning Black people were not viewed as a constant threat? Mm -hmm. What would that world look like? And then when we can reimagine what that world would look like, then we would have to even ask ourselves, what role do we actually need with the police to begin with? Now, most people will say, yes, if a violent act occurs, we do need someone to come and protect us. We agree with that. That's one thing. But many of these cases of police brutality and fatal killings are occurring with people who literally had their hands up or literally were reaching for a phone or literally said, oh, my scalp itches, I might need to you know, scratch it. And someone said, oh, oh thought that was, your hand was a gun. And so we have to really reimagine what, what um, images or what, what um, biases are impermeated within the police system that are making Black people be, being viewed as criminals, that are making us being viewed as a constant threat. We have to discuss those things first. And, you know, well, actually, we don't have to discuss it at all when I think about it. Actually, that's more so what, you know, training with police officers would likely need to discuss. What we need to, to discuss as community members are what ways that we can build. How can we build our communities? What are some ways that we can work together or, or can we invest in our communities? Can we start building new businesses to provide opportunities for people to engage in, you know, non-illegal activity. And so what resources can we bring to the communities? Can we acknowledge and begin to acknowledge the ways in which Black girls continue to be viewed as adults in the school system? They are punished harsher than their white counterparts. And we are also not examining the interpersonal 
challenges that many Black girls are facing at home in their communities. And so if they're experiencing vicariously domestic violence or if they are actual victims of domestic violence, sexual abuse, all of these really egregious and nefarious topics that we don't want to discuss, but they're happening. There's a seven-year-old Black girl out there that's being raped right now. And we don't want to talk about that because it's like, oh my gosh, that's so harsh. But those are the realities. Black girls are being brutalized, not only in the society, um, not only in the larger society um, realm, but they're also being brutalized in their homes, their communities, when they get to school. And then the larger societal narrative is, well, did you see what they were doing? Did you see what she had on? Oh, I thought she had a knife in her hand. Oh, whatever the case might be. And so we really need to go further than just saying their names. That is, that is a form of accountability. It is a form of, of recognizing who they were as an individual, but that is not the goal to continue to say her name within the context of deaths. If I want to say her name, I want to say her name of, oh, look at um, Markeisha, who just um, was accepted into college, or, you know, Janice, who just became the first attorney general, et cetera, et cetera. Those, right. That's when I want to say her name, not another name that has been killed. And so um, I'll just end it out with that. Of, of We really need to think about the protective measures that Black women and girls are not receiving and what we can do to begin to protect them. And they feel it. I work with um, high school girls all the time. They feel it. They say things like, if anything happens to me, no one will care. Mm -hmm. That's a harsh reality to hear from a high school young girl or a middle school girl to say, I see what is happening on TV. If anything happens to me, no one is going to do anything. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Badafalana. I'm going to go to Reverend Adams to talk about healing, but I want to encourage people who are watching, thank you again for watching, to put your questions in the chat, uh, put them in the Q&A. There's a question from Lori Stewart. Once we bring Reverend Adams into the conversation, I'll throw that question to Adam Jackson and to Kobe Flowers to answer, and we want to take your questions during this time. So Reverend Adams, uh, leading into the reading of the verdict, there were people all over this country, Black people in particular, who were praying, um, who were you know, locking arms down on their knees, just hoping that for once the system would work uh, the way it's supposed to, right? With equity and fairness for all. Kobe, uh, George Floyd's brother, Felonius, said he prayed for 30 minutes. And that when the verdict was announced, with guilty on all charges, a number of folks, they were crying and felt like something had been accomplished. Can you talk about what healing looks like in the age of, of accountability and police brutality? Sure, absolutely. Thank you again for uh, allowing me to be here today. Um, thinking about the verdict and all of the responses and reactions, I think it's, it, it really speaks to the collective uh, pain that the African-American community has had to endure since 1619 um, and all of the suffering that we have seen that came, comes out of the criminal justice system. Um, we know that there has been a historical record of police killings and police brutality against African-Americans, black bodies, and <clears throat> those criminal justice proceedings led into or led to the exoneration of uh, the killing of black people. And so what we see and what we've seen uh, from the praying, from the locking arms, from the joining together is the hope that finally, maybe one in this particular instance, we can see, I don't wanna use justice, the word justice, but we can see some sort of accountability prevail in this moment. So that's what we saw. We've seen this historical deep yearning for change, for some sort of um, acknowledgement that what is happening to black bodies is wrong, is an injustice, it's a brutalization, it's grounded in violence, and we pray and we hope because in spite of the evidence, in spite of all that was presented in the case, in spite of all of the testimony, there was still 
the aspect of African Americans holding their breath to say, we don't know if this is gonna happen. So that's where the prayers and all of that. The other thing is the suffering and the pain that African Americans and black bodies and black people in our black community has had to endure. And I say that because it seems, or from a faith context, right? I, I, I enter into this space as a pastor, I enter into this space as a man of faith. And I feel that what we're seeing in our society is, is transcendent or is deeper than what we're seeing at the physical uh, material level. What I mean by that is what we're seeing in the African-American community and black community from the suffering is a yearning for release, a, a yearning for liberation. And the cries that we're seeing, the, the responses that we're seeing reflect a deep visceral need to scream. I call it a soul cry, a wailing. And that's something spiritual. That's something more deep than just feeling the hurt and the pain of suffering um, at, a, at an emotional or cognitive level. I'm speaking at a soul level. Now, there's this deep need, this visceral need that, that, that is a wailing that I believe is, is engendered by our ancestors wailing with us. So we're seeing this in the black community, and that's why we're, we're, we're trying to hold one another up. See, the word compassion is one of my favorite words in the English language because words are my friend, and I love breaking down the etymology and the origins of words. But compassion is one of my favorite words because compassion is um, passion meaning suffering and the prefix calm meaning with. And so when we talk about this visceral soul cry, the need for compassion is the crying out for us to have a space and a place where black people are suffering with one another. We're in this moment because of the collective suffering that leads and engenders this visceral need to scream, this visceral need to cry out, this visceral need to wail. But unfortunately, we don't find those spaces and healing is going to come when we collectively come together and engage in this collective suffering with one another and we can try to be healed through what I love to call beloved community. But there has to be an intentional um, intentionality around how we engage one another, how we bring those aspects of repair and restoration and all of the things that we need in our community. So uh, before I close, and I'm not gonna talk any uh, much longer, uh, I'm going to call on the voice of one of the people that I admire the most in this world. Um, uh, one of my favorite thinkers and writers, Bell Hooks, who emphatically asserts that the starting point for rethinking and reimagining healing begins with the authentic ethic of love. Mm -hmm. For the absence of a sustained concentration on the ag agapeic form of love, that is the unconditional sacrificial form of love, it will always create a circular reiteration of hate and violence. Any effort and suffering and dealing with trauma that goes unresolved, which leads to disenfranchised grief. And if we are to change the circumstances and the structures of healing, then institutions have to not only enforce policy changes, but also engage in the efforts that say, we are going to intentionally provide spaces of care where people can breathe. I, I bring that up because we are in a moment where, where the theme of our society, the meta theme of our society is not being able to breathe. And that is also uh, metaphorically and um, uh, comparably aligned with our souls not being able to breathe. And I say that in a, in a specific sense, 20 minutes before the verdict was rendered on the, the Chauvin trial, we have another young black lady, body, child, 16 years old, murdered. We don't have time to breathe because trauma and suffering and violence happens back to back and it's immediate 
And so the cry out and the healing is going to require us to create, intentionally create those spaces. And I say it starts in the black church. As a pastor, the church has to be accountable for holding space, for people to breathe. And we have to come out of these um, false narratives that only certain people belong in these spaces, which is why we're not seeing people enter into the space of church, because those are violent spaces as well. Right. Those are the spaces that we need to begin to say, this is where you can come to breathe. I don't care about your ideology. All I care about is your soul, your well-being, your wellness. And when we talk about peace in the sense of the Hebrew word shalom, shalom is peace. And it's not just the absence of conflict, but shalom is a wellness, a holistic wellness of completeness and uh, well-being. And so in the sense of what we talk about at Loyola, in the sense of cure personalis, care for the whole person, church has to be that space where we can breathe again, where we can heal again, where we can begin to do and find those spaces that the, the, that the other areas in this world are not allowing us to have that. And it has to be grounded in intentional empathy and adjacency. Thank you so much, Reverend Adams. So, so folks, we want to, to encourage you to put your questions and that we pulled everyone into the conversation. There's a question on the floor from Lori Stewart. Um, and I'll start with you, Adam, because I, I'd like you to do two things. One, I'd like you to answer Lori Stewart's question, but, but I have another question I want to ping you with. Let me read Lori Stewart's question first. Since BPD is under the control of Baltimore City, not under the control of Baltimore City, but under Maryland control, can you speak to how that affects our city's ability slash power to move toward divesting and um, abolishing? I'd like you to answer that, Adam, but I'd also like you to respond a bit to Reverend Adams because he's centering the church as a place where this needs to happen. I'm a PK, so I stand with that idea of the church, but I also know for a lot of young people coming out of Black Lives Matter, the church is not where they went uh, for safety, security, and to breathe. They took it to the streets to demand this change. So can you kind of talk about maybe that tension there and then answer Lori Stewart's question? Yeah, absolutely. So um, to, the first, to the first question about the uh, local control of police and its effect, on abolishing or defunding the police. Um, it's complicated. So first is talking about some of the mechanics. Uh, the Baltimore City Police Department was taken from Baltimore, I believe in the late 19th century in terms of control of the actual department. And for a lot of reasons that, that relate to racism and you know the white population wanting to have control over the department. And then most of the control was returned to the city in the 70s, I believe in the mid 70s. But what people, but, but in terms of the mechanics, it's still technically a state agency. And there are some things that to change the, the internal policies of the department must go through the state legislature. The complicated thing is that every law enforcement agency in the state of Maryland is under the providence of state law, meaning that every law enforcement agency is subject to what the state says, the, 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 the policies that it lays out, regardless of the local laws that may be in place in certain jurisdictions. Uh, it's under the providence of state law. So there was a bill passed this session that will eventually put this question on should the Baltimore City Police Department be a local city, city agency. It's gonna be on the ballot either in 2022 or 2024. And the, the issue with it is what people think is control, like the, the Baltimore City Mayor appoints the commissioner, the majority, we set the budget. We, you know, Baltimore City gives the budget to the police department. So all the things that look like there's control of the department locally are there. It's just that technically on paper, it's a state agency. And technically there's certain kinds of procedures that the Baltimore City Council uh, can't enforce because it's technically a state agency. So some things might be made easier if it was made a local Baltimore City agency like, you know, Breckett Parks and other agencies. Uh, but for the most part, in terms of the actual mechanics, the things that people are concerned about, being able to hold police accountable, it's under the providence of state law. I mean, you have to go to the state at, whether it was a city agency or not, you would have to go to the state legislature to change anything regarding the uh, police department and its and its actual uh, policies and procedures uh, as it relates to the law. But to um, but to the question about uh, what does it mean for abolishing and defunding the police, you know, I, because I, you know I heard yesterday that there was a, there was a Baltimore City Taxpayers Night with uh, Mayor Brandon Scott, uh, members of the council, and the general public. Who had a lot of feedback about the budget presented and there was a lot of calls to take money 
like a hundred million dollars or fifty million dollars, et cetera, from the police and put it in social programs and to put it in certain funds for certain things. But you know, I take the unpopular position that it's not that although abolishing and defunding the police are very good things are things that should happen. The issue is that because we lack the level of infrastructure to actualize that, because we still can't meet the need of public safety without police, given the lack of infrastructure, most black people don't find that a popular position. And it's not your typical black folks that people would think would take that position like conservatives or et cetera. You know, there's, there's black people in community, like somebody like people's grandmas and aunties whose concern is public safety. So when they go out into their porch, they wanna make sure that there's no violence. And if somebody's doing something or if they need support and help, who are they gonna call? And if you give black people the choice of more police or less police, most black people will probably choose more police because that's all we understand as having, being safe in our own communities. But there's always a third option. And the third option is the actual alternative. And the problem with the conversation about abolishing the police and defunding the police is that that is almost never present, is that people aren't typically offering the alternative. And the alternative is not, I'm gonna be frank, you know, it's not the alternative is, the not, is not to fund white nonprofits to do more work in black people's communities. The alternative is to not give the local government more money to mismanage, to put in another put into another pit. What we need to do is to have an independent, uh, independent infrastructure that black people control where we can administer public safety to our communities. There's examples of that happening now with safe streets in Baltimore and, uh, pu and public effort and more community-based efforts like uh, uh, ceasefire, Baltimore ceasefire. And these are efforts that they were funded at the same level of a police department, and they were able to build the infrastructure to intervene in, in issues uh, pertaining to violence, then we could see an alternative. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that most people, it's, only, it's one or the other. It's, real, it's, real, it's, a, it's this real dichotomy of, I can only pick one or the other. It's an either or situation, more or less police, more money. Like the Baltimore City Police Department has a half a billion dollar budget. It's a third of the, of the budget of the entire city of Baltimore. And most people's natural inclination is, well, we need to take that money and put it there. But let me tell you something. You could give $100 million to somebody, but if there's no infrastructure to necessitate the actual, the actual practice of carrying out, keeping Black people safe, then all you're doing is putting the problem, putting the burden on someone else. And so that is typically missing from the conversation. I feel like people think it's easy. You know, people that are a lot of advocates in my age group, you know, like between, you know, I guess your late 20s, early 30s, our biggest uh, deficiency is that we are not focusing on that question because infrastructure is what white supremacists have. Infrastructure is what white folks got. Infrastructure what allows them to continue to propagate the assaults on black people in this country. And because they have these ecosystems of, of, of institutions, organizations, resources, that's how those things are allowed to persist. And unless we build the alternative for mm -hmm. black people, and these things, and these things sound like a pipe dream. Because people, people think when you say abolish the police, it sounds like we will never abolish the police. Mm -hmm. But the issue is we've never really given ourselves the opportunity to build the alternative. And it takes a long time. It's not the sexy work. People like people like sexy things. People want to people want to go into a demonstration, leave tomorrow, and want things to be different suddenly. But a systemic problem requires a systemic thrust. Meaning you can't, uh, you can't expect to solve for a systemic problem, especially law, uh, 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 police brutality and, uh, and law enforcement. You can't expect to solve the multi-generational issue of that with a couple demonstrations and some you know, conversations with people. It requires a systemic thrust. So that's my answer to that question. That we have to actually build the alternative. And regardless of the city to, uh, police department being uh, locally controlled or not, our energy should be focused on what is the actual alternative to public safety that's not the police. Um, and to the, to the second question about the church, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm a Christian myself, and I typically think that the questions around um, what the Black church is doing and not doing, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a, it's a question based in cynicism, because people don't see the church doing what the church needs to do in the instances where we need the church to step up. And I think that's a gross overgeneralization by people of my generation. The church is one of the most sustainable institutions in the black community. It is an institution that has stood the test of time. It is one of the, it's what, and it's the one place where I feel like black people intuitively have been able to sustain it through resources, 
through their membership in churches and being able to organize historically. I mean, we can, we can go the whole gamut of history and how the black church overall has been a part of black freedom struggle. And so when people say they didn't go to the church, they went to demonstrate. Well, the thing is, the, the church is still gonna be present regardless. And it's not like everything has to align politically. There's a lot of pastors that I know, a lot of leaders in churches that I know who've been extremely supportive of me over the years. And even though they may, you know, there's, I mean, we could talk about the politics of, you know, some of these coalitions that pop up and what pastors can are prone to do in the Democratic Party structure. We could talk about that uh, and how that can be problematic. But, you know, just like anything else with Black people, it's complicated. It's not, it's not, it's not a simple answer. You know, we to, to, to write off pastors as, you know, oh, they just with the establishment or to write them off as ineffective. Regardless, it's an institution that exists in our community, has capacity and resources that can really give uh, energy to our fights. And I think that we spend too much time overgeneralizing it. So I think that when people say they went to the streets and I didn't go to church, it's like, yeah, but that's not new. Like, it's not a, you're not a brand, you're not, just because you felt an overwhelming frustration and took your energy to one space instead of the other, doesn't need to denigrate the church in the process. Just like everything else in this country, like I mean, I, I mean, I praise pastors at, who have to keep the numbers up because when the bills need to get paid, when the mortgage is, when the mortgage bill comes in the mail, when the members aren't showing up, or you know when things need to happen, you know, running an organization like that's I mean, just like anything else. And so to 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 admonish the church and act like it isn't present to me is a, it's like we, we aren't really paying attention to the structural dynamics at play. And black people need each other. We need each other. We need to support each other. And a part of what I do as a political, we do it as a political organization. We understand that all of our institutions are important. We don't need to do the same thing. And we can still unite under certain ideas and concepts that doesn't, it doesn't mean that we all have to be like, this bill needs to pass this way. It just means that we need to unite around certain ideas and concepts. So that way, when it comes time for war, when it comes time for war, we're on the same side. Thank you so much. Now we have another question from the floor. Christina Kelly wanted to know, and I'm going to throw this one to Kobe Flowers and for everyone who's watching, please submit your questions, things that you're thinking about as we talk about rethinking policing, uh, equity, and justice in Black and Brown communities. Christina Kelly would like to know, uh, Kobe, can we discuss the consent degree? You, you mentioned it earlier and exactly how it's being implemented and what phase is it currently in? Does it mandate community and citizen involvement? Yeah, great, uh, great question. Um, so I want to talk about the consent decree in Baltimore by backing up a little bit and just talking about the history of these consent decrees. So as I said, look, they, these consent decrees came out in the wake of the um, Rodney King police brutality um, case. Um, so that's 1994, right? So now we are almost 30 years in doing consent decrees. Um, some of the largest police departments have been under consent decrees. Here in DC, this police department, New York Police Department, LA Police Department. Now we're here at the Baltimore Police Department. Ask yourself, are you happy with how those police departments um, operate? Um, and again, it's been three decades that we've been doing these consent decrees. Mm -hmm. The next point I want to make is when you look at the people who are doing these consent decrees, and I want to feel a little bit from what Adam Jackson just said, it typically is uh, big law firms um, that are not owned by us um, who are in charge of these consent decrees. Um, let's take Baltimore, for example. The Independent Monitor um, is a, a very talented lawyer by the name of Kenneth Thompson, an African-American man. Kenneth Thompson's a partner at Venable. Um, Kenneth Thompson works with one of my former colleagues from the Civil Rights Division, who's also a partner at Venable, a man by the name of Seth Res Rosenthal. They run this Independent Monitor. They run, they are the people in charge of enforcing that consent decree, okay? So, um, every few months or so, they that law firm is paid a sizable amount of money from uh, the people up here in Baltimore um, to go ahead and run that consent decree. If you look at who's on the um, that independent monitor team, not only do you have lawyers from places like Venable, um, but you typically have former police officers. You typically have former federal prosecutors. You typically do not have the Adam Jacksons of the world. All right. Now I want to be a little bit more sophisticated in this. To be clear, the uh, monitor team does have, you know, um, um, uh, 
uh, advocates does does um, involve and work with the people they have hearings um, to, to hear what what people have have to say. Um, but it is not lost on me having done this work for over for several decades um, that we're essentially asking by way of the consent decree process the police to monitor and check the police. Mm-hmm. Right. So you have again, you know, Charles Ramsey was is is what was on. I'm not sure if he's still on the um, uh, independent monitor team, but he, but he was on the independent monitor team. Charles Ramsey, African American um, law enforcement officer, was here in D.C. was up in Philly. Um, I'm confident Charles M- Ramsey is a good man who, who who operates in a place of good faith. But it's not lost on me that we're trying to reform the police department through these consent decrees and we're asking essentially the prosecutors and the police to be in charge of reforming them and we're not leaning in on um, more of the advocates and people who come from outside of that structure um, to reform the um, to, to reform the, the police department so to, to, the, to the extent that the question is listen hey where are we now well we've been doing this consent decree for about four years um they are this happens with all consent decrees you and and i have been a part of that process too so folks need to know i've looked at a lot of consent decrees and 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 that's why i know people like uh um uh, mr ken thompson and mr seth rosenthal um because i've I've worked with them to help them think critically and smartly about how you um uh, deal with consent decrees not only here in baltimore but but in other cities um but if you ask yourself okay where is the consent decree now? Where 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 is it going? I, I would invite you to jump up on their website because they publish everything. Um, that's one that I think the good things about the consent decree process is they it's it's all public and, and the website is, is uh, www.bpdmonitor.com. Um, so that's where you can go to find out everything about the the consent decree process. Um, I, I will just say again. Uh, and I'll end here by, by saying that we've been doing consent decrees for 30 years. And yet, you know, the consent decree did not stop, um, you, you know, uh, uh, Freddie Gray, um, even though it was, it was before Freddie Gray, um, Baltimore Police Department, even though they didn't have the consent decree in, in place but when Freddie Gray was going on, um, the Baltimore Police Department was still working with the Justice Department to reform the training and the policy. Right. And so, again, I think I want to just end with saying that we've been doing I want to end where I started. We've been doing the same thing for 150 years. Consent decrees. Yeah, that, that's a new tool. We've been using that for 30 years, training people, trying to get the police department to be better. But let's go back to the George Floyd trial. And while we're all here, let's not forget Derek Chauvin had been trained. Not only had he been trained, he was a trainer. Trainer. So this idea that we can train our way out of this problem, we can we can solve the problem by training. Again, I'm here to raise the question: If Derek Chauvin, who was one of the best in the Minneapolis Police Department because he was a trainer of police officers, how much faith should we really have in in training? A lot of people are very very happy to have seen, and I'm sorry I'm going a little bit long, but I'm just I'm, let me try to end maybe for the third time on this point. Um, Everybody was happy to see uh, Police Chief Arredondo take the stand and say, hey, Derek Chauvin did not follow um, police policy, right? Um, I know, having prosecuted police officers, it is very, very difficult to have the chief uh, cross that blue wall and go ahead and say, hey, one of my own did wrong. But you want to talk about accountability? Where was the accountability for Chief Arredondo? Mm. Derek Chauvin was trained under his watch. Right. Derek Chauvin was a trainer of trainers under his watch. Police Chief Arredondo did not take the stand to say, I'm sorry, people, I failed you. He took the stand to point the finger at Derek Chauvin, which, you know, when you got people protesting in the streets and it is what it is, what it is now, I think that, you know, um, that's one course. I think that the more courageous course would have been for Chief Aradano to say himself as a police officer, he takes responsibility. He should be held accountable. That's why I say, as a person who used to prosecute police officers, I take responsibility because I know what I did did not solve the problem. And I went to law school to solve problems as a civil rights lawyer, as a civil rights uh, prosecutor. So uh, forgive the long-winded answer. No, 
thank you so much. I, I just, I'm thinking a lot about what everyone is putting on the table and we appreciate that and encourage people to give their questions. Uh, Dr. Battle, I wanna come to you with a question from Christina Kelly, um, but, but just to frame that, I went to the statistics from Mapping Police Violence, which is available online. And they laid out that more than 1,000 unarmed people have died due to police harm from 2013 to 2019. And out of that number, 17% of them were Black folks, like 1.3 times higher than any other race or ethnicity. And if you just take last year, in the midst of a global pandemic, while Black folks were being disproportionately impacted, dying at a higher rate, contracting at a higher rate, which has not gone down. But last year, from January to August, police killed at least one Black person every single week in 48 of the 50 states. I think Rhode Island and Vermont are the only two states that did not have a police killing um, of a Black person during that time. So when, when Adam Jackson talked about the alternative, Number three, Christina Kelly's like, in light of all this, how do we educate people to want the alternative? And, and then how do we build the infrastructure given the reality of just these statistics we've just laid down? Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't think that we even need to make it a complicated answer. As a professor, I take the approach of merging theory and praxis. Mm -hmm. And so, I think we need to have an understanding so that we have historical context, so that we understand patterns and themes, and we understand the why of why um, certain events happen, but we can only go but so far solely reading a book. And that's where the praxis comes in. So in my classroom, there is always an actual practical component. And so you say, well, how do we, um, raise this information? How do we spread awareness? I will have my students form groups. I usually have maybe about 50 students and then they'll get into six different groups. And then they have to, each group has to identify two to three community organizations um, in the Petersburg or Richmond community, some for them Norfolk. Um, and they need to actually work with that community organization. So if that community organization has a particular project that they're working on, my students are now working in conjunction with them. Um, another thing that um, we do here, well, I do um, in my classroom is also spreading awareness on campus. And so um, like Adam was saying earlier, you know, people want things, you know, sexy. Okay, you want that? All right, we'll make it fun. And so I, um, I remember I said, all right, students, get into your groups. We're going to have a block party on campus. Now, of course, that's going to bring everybody out because we're having music, food, etc. But we're also going to have pamphlets out there. We're also going to have a spoken word piece out there where people are going to speak about these topics that are so prevalent in our communities. And, um, and that's essentially what I've done. I've even, I remember a class that I had, um, it was victimology. And I said, I'm gonna make this class where you all have to set up your own businesses. And many people thought, well, what in the world does victimology and you having them create their own businesses have to do with anything? Well, you know, there is a theory that says that people are more likely to engage in criminal activity when they don't have anything to do. And so if perhaps we build these um, resources for other people, and now if we get into the mindset of, I am going to create something that I can now provide an opportunity for people who may not have, um, who are disenfranchised from certain employment opportunities, now we can begin to do something. Is that the full answer? No, I'm just saying that's just my role. And so I believe as a professor that if we move away from being solely textbook and actually literally have our students going out into the community and that is their grade and that is the way um, that they are now understanding and advancing their understanding of this issue, I think that that's a start. 
Thank you. I want to go to Reverend Adams next, and then I'm going to circle back around to Adam Jackson, because I want to talk about Freddie Gray, um, Adam Jackson and Kobe Flowers and accountability. Reverend Adams, can you talk to us about rethinking the police? Like, what exactly would that look like in a just society? That's the million dollar question, I think, um, that we're all really struggling and trying to grasp and, and really work around how we can begin to create that um, that structure. I think I, I would have to agree with uh, what Adam uh, spoke of earlier. And I think that there has to be the alternative. Um, if we look at the history of the police department, we know that the police um, department, all of the, the aspects of policing was grounded in uh, slavery and slave catching. And I think that that is the DNA. That's the origin of what we're working with. And so when we talk about abolishing police, um, I think that we have to look at developing structures outside of the structure that we're already in. When we're talking about abolishing, I think it's a both and though. When we're talking about abolishing police, we have to look at the reallocation of funds that are being um, poured into police departments to say, these are the things that um, are not effective. This war mentality is not effective. We're seeing body cameras being worn by police that aren't preventing murders. We're seeing police, police community policing and increased money for training to reinforce, I believe, what's a false sense of police legitimacy and expand the reach of police's into communities and private lives through per surveillance and, and all of the other challenges that we're seeing, um, more money, more technology, more power, and more influence, all of those things will not reduce uh, the burdens that are being inflicted upon uh, the justice of policing. What I do believe will um, be the key to having a just police society is uh, ending the war on drugs, ending the policies that promote that, ending the um, or abolishing school police where we're pushing truancy um, that leads to the school to prison pipeline, ending that ideology of broken windows policing um, and developing as opposed to that, then pouring in and investing money um, and reallocating the funds from militarization to a robust mental health care program and creating low income housing um, that will do more to reduce abusive policing. And so um, I think, again, it's a both and type of scenario where, in fact, we have to look at the structure of what we're dealing with and what we're working with right now. And that means the, the, the defunding or reallocation of funds for the current police, but then also looking at ways within our community to collectively work with community partners, to collectively come together with individuals and investing in individuals and communities designed to effectively transform some of the basic and economic and political arrangements in our society. And, and really beginning to collaboratively and, and work together in our community where we're followers of the leaders of a beautiful struggle, where we as the church, we as the nonprofit organizations, we as the, the higher educational professors and all of us are intentionally and authentically coming together to collectively develop strategies that are going to be utilized for the greater good of our people. And I, I just, let me just real quick talk about the church as well and why I often think that um, Black Lives Matters and 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 because and, it ties into that, but the Black Lives Matter movement and, and some of the younger uh, generation aren't coming to church. I think one of the things that we need to do now here, I agree again with Adam, that the church is the greatest institution in the history of the world for, and this is just my opinion, but it's the greatest institution in the history of the world for the uh, liberation and the promotion of, of, of blackness in our society and, and how we have been restored and how we continue to, to, to grow and heal 
and uh, have the things that we need. I think the black church is the greatest institution in the history of the world for that. Um, I'm biased, but I'll, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But the other thing I think in this context of what we're talking about today is that we have to also reimagine church. We also have to rethink church. And maybe if the, the sentiment is, I didn't go to church, I went to the streets. Well, maybe the, they, the church should be meeting those who don't go to the church building in the streets. And maybe the church needs to be in the streets also in order to engage those who are coming into those spaces and then, but reimagining the way we do things. So all of this is about reimagining and re rethinking. A, and, and in order for us to think about or rethink police in a just society, we have to imagine what a just society really is and really answer that question before we can talk about having police in a just society as well. Before I go to Adam Jackson, uh, I want to come to Kobe Flowers uh, because Kobe has to step out at 115. So I want to come to you, Kobe, because we know that while we've been dealing with the Chauvin trial, we've been thinking about other people. Dante Wright, the 20 year old that was shot uh, at the traffic stop by officer uh, Kim Potter, who thought she had her taser, which is hard for people to believe. And instead she had a gun waving around and she shot and killed him. We're thinking about Adam Toledo, the 13 year old that was shot in Chicago. Um, there are pictures of him that he may have perhaps had a weapon before, but when he turned and his hands were up, his hands were empty, even though police officers said that his hand, that he had a gun in his hand. We've also seen the video, Kobe, of police officers eight minutes after the shooting of Adam Toledo across the wire saying, turn off your body cameras. If you're going to where the shooting is, turn off your body cameras. And then of course, just a few days ago, Makaya Bryant, the 16 year old who was shot. Now we can debate about the knife and you know, I know Dr. Battle will go crazy if you start trying to excuse away the shooting and killing of black girls because of her behavior, but just talking about the fact that we have not had an opportunity to breathe, stop, reflect, think in the midst of all this. So, so with that in mind, can you share with us before you go this notion of abolishing the police and why it doesn't mean we won't have some protections in place? Like, what does that look like for people so they can understand it? Right. It's a great question. Um, it's a great question also because this is something what Dr. Battle kind of mentioned that, listen, you know, if does abolishing the police really mean that when something violent happens, um, we're not going to have someone to call? Um, and I, I answered the question by saying, well, of course not, but we have got to figure out what does that look like? Know this, everyone. Police respond to violent calls about 4% of the time. 96% of the time, in other words, they don't. This narrative that we've got to have the police because there's all this violence out there is just, just not true, right? Um, why is a traffic stop one of the uh, most uh, difficult times for a police and the person being um, pulled over? I submit because the police is pulling over somebody with a gun. Why is it that we can't have traffic stops done by someone trained not to have a gun, trained simply to pull a car over if the car is going too fast? Right. So uh, we've got to get away from this narrative that we have to have police because there's all this violence out here, right? Um, and using the literally hundreds of millions of dollars that go into police budgets um, to have more kind of discussions and find solutions that we're, that we're trying to deal with here, right? Um, and, and let us not forget that all of that money, you cannot really find in, in, in my view, an institution in society where you can fail by any kind of uh, reasonable metric and still get your budget increased. Right, um, you know the the murder rate in Baltimore is is still what it is, and the police budget is still you know probably the largest line item on, on the budget, right? So to reimagine 
uh, public safety would mean instead of using all of those resources to make sure that the Baltimore police or, or, or whoever have the latest SUV, you know, $60,000, $70,000 car, why is it that we don't make sure that the black girl in West Baltimore has the latest iPad? That right. why don't we make sure that the black girl in West Baltimore, whose um, mother might not be there, or father might not be there, that there is a safe space for her to go and be educated and for her to achieve whatever she's going to achieve in, in her life. You know, can you imagine we spent hundreds of millions of dollars on that black girl in West Baltimore? Mm. Wouldn't our societies be a lot safer? Last thing I will say in, 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 in parting is I also was a public defender here in Baltimore. And I will tell you that every 99% of all of the people that I represented did not finish high school, did not have a job. Most of them, and, and Reverend Adams got to this a little bit too, most of them had significant mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine we took hundreds of millions of dollars and made sure that every, I'll go back to the girl in West Baltimore, was able to finish high school. We took hundreds of millions of dollars and every girl in West Baltimore, we guaranteed she was going to have a job doing something that, you know, her ability and her talent, her talent would allow her to do. If we took hundreds of millions of dollars and made sure that that girl in West Baltimore had mental health treatment. Right. Would we have the violent streets that we have in Baltimore, in Washington, D.C., in Los Angeles, in New York, Cleveland? I submit we would not. It's been a pleasure, Dr. K, working so with you, learning from you. Dr. Battle, a, a pleasure. Thank you so much for letting me come in and, and learn from you, Reverend Adams. Uh, my hat is off to you, sir. Thank you for what you're doing with the Black Church. Thank you for being here. And Adam Jackson, I mean, I've only you know, read about you, seen you in the streets. And, and, and again, you are an inspiration for me too, all right? So uh, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. And uh, thank you so much for letting me learn from all of you. And Kobe Thank Flowers you. is a partner with Brown, Goldstein, and Levy. He's been prosecuting police officers for uh, quite a long time, over 20 years yeah. or so. He's well, still I will say, Dr. Bell, just so you know, so I used to prosecute police officers when I was in the Civil Rights Division as a prosecutor, ah, okay. and I left. Um, but, but arguably, I still do that now because I sue police officers. Okay. But, you know, this will be a hot take I'll leave on. I also defend police officers because when I say I believe in prison abolition, that's what I believe in. When I say I want to solve the problem of police br brutality, I know putting an, an officer in a cage doesn't solve that problem. And there will be more people that look like me um, who will uh, suffer the brunt of that problem not being solved. So that's our next panel. Thank you so much. <laughs> I cut. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So Adam Jackson, let me come to you because I, I find that over the last year or so, and people, please, we have about 15 minutes left. So put your questions up. I want to talk about something that's a little controversial. Um, I want to talk about Black Lives Matter. And let me tell you what's controversial is that it's been used for everything. I mean, I'm talking Black Lives Matter was used by corporations last year after the murder of George Floyd. Now, my own biases will come out, Adam, you know me. So of course I had a problem with, with babynames.com saying Black Lives Matter and putting the names of unarmed Black people who had been killed on the first page of searching for the name for your baby or, or Amazon. But we can name all the companies and corporations from Nike tennis shoes with a Black Lives Matter label to Black Lives Matter marches in, in all white communities that then put down their t-shirts and put down their yard signs and went back to business as usual. The, the, the support for Black Lives Matter in June of last year was over 72% because 50% of that came from the white community. By August, end of the summer, the support for Black Lives Matter had dropped to less than 20%. And the biggest drop was in the white community going, you know what, it was a good summertime interest and we're back to, to things moving on. What exactly does Black Lives Matter mean and why has it become the go-to slogan for everything from new tennis shoes to some of the more serious problems around lead poisoning? I mean, how much time we got? It's, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a question. That is definitely a question. And, um, you know, to, you know, especially for the younger people watching, I think context is always important. Mm -hmm. So what we, are describing as Black Lives Matter are, is two separate things. 
One is the pop culture, the pop cultural reference, the pop cultural moment we are, cu- we are currently in, hashtag Black Lives Matter, which when most people talk about Black Lives Matter, the story goes three black women created the hashtag after the murder of Trayvon Martin. And it, pr- it became more popular during the time of, uh, after the murder of Mike Brown. And then there was consistent reporting on killings of uh, black people by law enforcement. And it became a pop culture moment. So there's that element of it. And that's what most of us encounter when we think about Black Lives Matter. There is also the second component, which is the actual formal institution, Black Lives Matter Global Network. And that's an, that's an actual organization uh, that people have had criticisms of in the past and, and currently uh, as it relates to resources and effectiveness, et cetera. There's also other organizations that have benefited or been birthed from the pop cultural moment of Black Lives Matter, like Movement for Black Lives, and a lot of other large national formations uh, where people are claiming that they, or, or, or in fact do one or the other, uh, that they are claiming that they work to uh, end the war on Black people as it relates to law enforcement. So there's all these different pieces at play. Here's my perspective. My perspective is that we are currently trapped in a cycle of white corporate media that has figured out how to benefit financially from the deaths of black people. Mm. And what is happening is that cycle is allowed to proliferate because of how, because of our response. We're responding how human beings will respond in a white supremacist society. So it's not wild that a black person, when we see a video of a, of a teenager, of a teenage black girl being shot to death by, by a law enforcement officer, it's normal to react strongly to that. But what they've, what white companies have figured out, this is not just, I mean, this is not like pie in the sky. I'm talking about Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I'm talking about CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, every major corporate media entity. These entities have figured out, even if it's awful, even if it's violent, if we prop these stories up as the centerpiece, we get more ad revenue. More people are watching our television shows. More people are watching or buying our goods and services because this is a pop cultural moment that now we get to claim support for. But to your point, Dr. K, we don't actually have to put any actual meat to that. We don't actually have to do anything as a result. So my issue when it comes to people saying Black Lives Matter is that it literally means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. I like vanilla ice cream. It literally means nothing. It's just something I'm saying. To me, and people have different versions of what it means to demonstrate your commitment to Black people. See, me, my a demonstration of a white person or a white company or white corporation's commitment to Black people is their willingness to, one, redistribute power and resources, to actually fight against the forces that are killing Black people every day, and to take unpopular stances on things that relate to Black people. Like, so I want to see if Nike wants to talk to me about Black Lives Matter, don't put it on a shoe. Talk about that fraternal order of police. Talk about how their racist legislation is continuing these policies and practices. Support local act- activism and advocacy. You know, I, the University of uh, System of Maryland, you know, just had like a, they have a big Black Lives Matter sign, I think on Green Street in downtown. It's like, yeah, don't talk to me about that. I want to see more investment in how, and local organizations that are administering services to Black people. That, so that way we can stop depending on large civic institutions like hospitals and other nonprofits, and we can rely more on uh, organizations and infrastructure created by us. And I think that, uh, and the last thing I'll say is that part of the problem is that what, what our, our, our young people are being sold lies as it relates to what it means to be an activist. See, I don't even like the word activist. The word activist is so overused. It's, so, it's, it's, a, it's a corny term to me because it means I get to claim a lot of things. People associate activists with all these beautiful, awesome acts of valor. You know, I'm standing in the streets, I'm fighting against the structure. But to me, that's, you're supposed to do that. That's mm-hmm. not a, that's not a thing, that's not a thing, that's not a title you should want, I, I'm an activist, you know? Every black person's an activist as long as they have a commitment to black people and are working every day on behalf of black people. So every black person can be an activist if possible, but the, but the, but the formula for activism now quote unquote activism is I'm gonna I'm gonna film videos of and share content that is destructive to black people. 
I'm then going to get on television and local media and social media talk about these issues constantly. I'm going to be propping up these images and 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 create and feed the narrative that Black people are powerless and hopeless, and that all we can do is demonstrate and protest. That's what we feed, and then we become celebrities. We become popular. Now it's like Adam Jackson's the celebrity, the social media activist celebrity. Corny, terrible. It does not help Black people, and people don't think that. And, people, and our young people don't. They see all these people who are popular, famous, seeing that they have money, that are activists. When in reality, the activists are people's grandmothers in community helping people, helping Black girls. You know, those are the activists. The Black people who are running PTAs to make sure that young people have their supplies every day at school. Those are the activists. And those are the people who don't get on, who aren't on television. Those are the people that are unseen. Those are the people that are invisible. These are the people that most of us walk by every day and we just kind of go, oh, they're not as important. And I think that what we, what we want it to be, we want it to be an after school special. We want it to be like, one day we're going to wake up and America is going to be better for our community. We're going to convict more officers. It's like, if you understand the nature of racism and white supremacy in this country, if you understand chattel enslavement, and you understand Jim Crow, if you understand the nature of the criminal justice system, you know that these things are not affective. It's not about how white people feel. This is about white supremacist institutions. It's about white supremacist infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And my problem is, is that that's what white media wants us to do. It's like, see how we're taking small steps. It's like a small step. Like, I don't want any more small steps. I want investment. I want resources. I want power and control. The definition of power is the ability to define phenomena and make it act in a desired manner. We can keep we can keep talking about the phenomena and talking about why police brutality exists, but if we can't make that phenomena act in a desired manner, if we can't do anything about it, then hashtagging, Twitter media, social media, all that stuff is going to fall short. Thank you so much, Adam Jackson, folks. We're down to our last 10 minutes. And so I'm kind of making my way around to the last comment. We do have a question coming to you, Reverend Adams, in just a second about Loyola specifics. So we will definitely pass that one to you. But I want to go to Dr. Battle because, because born out of the Black Lives Matter movement, was something very specific that was launched by Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, who is a, a lawyer and an advocate, and she founded the African American Policy Forum. She actually, you know, really centralized the word intersectionality, but she pushed forward the hashtag Say Her Name movement, specifically designed to draw attention to unarmed Black girls and Black women who were being killed, because we were kind of, as Adam Jackson, making it a slogan. Hands up, don't shoot. Wear a hoodie and buy Skittles. Lay in the street for nine. Like, it became this kind of what we call actorvism, right, around showing I can do something by wearing my hoodie. But Kimberly Crenshaw pushed against that with hashtag say her name. Can you talk about that, particularly in light of this moment we're dealing with now with Micaiah Battle, and then Reverend Adams will have our last word before we wrap. Yes, so Say Her Name um, most definitely does not receive the same national attention um, as Black Lives Matter. Um, I do believe that um, activism at this point is becoming very performative and just as long as you are able to say Black Lives Matter, maybe put up a nice little Facebook post or a tweet, you've done your job and now you can assuage your guilt. And so we have to really think about are we doing things because we want to pat on the bat or um, are we doing things because we want that photo op that when you were amongst thousands of people in the crowd, but somehow you were just that one person that got the photo op with the with your arms behind being arrested. I mean, those are those things, these little games that people keep playing around, like, like just stop. And so when I think about if we really want to say her name, I think about when Kamala Harris was, you know, running for vice president and how all of the sororities uh, galvanized around um, supporting her and making sure that people voted for her. I have not seen that with the sororities when it comes to violence against Black girls. Sandra Bland was a member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Nobody, well, I don't want to say nobody, but to my knowledge, the only people that were really pushing um, her, um, her death on you know a serious level were other members of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. And I was wondering, well, where are the AKs? Where are the Deltas? Where are the Zetas? And that's just that one particular incident. And so we have institutions that have been around for over a hundred years that are um, 
centered, Black women centered, what are we doing to really say her name? Or do we only pop up with a scholarship check and a photo op at homecoming when it looks good? Let's keep it real if we really want others to take us seriously. And so Reverend Adams, I come to you because as we're talking about, you know, rethinking policing, equity and justice in black and brown communities, it's also important to note that we are here on the campus of Loyola University. We're not all in the same space, but the Carson Institute is housed at Loyola University. And so the question around how does Loyola as an institution here in Baltimore City, how does it redistribute power and resources to local communities is Lori Stewart's question. And she used the words outside of white saviorism. So I'm going to have you answer that, Reverend Adams. And then uh, Adam Jackson and Sean Battle, we're going to come to each person for your final closing thoughts, and then we will wrap. Reverend Adams, the Loyola question is, is at your feet, sir. Great question. Um, I appreciate the question. I think what we need to look at is um, how is Loyola as a community investing in Baltimore? We uh, portray ourselves as an anchor institution in Baltimore City, um, but I also know that that requires investment and that requires uh, a lot of work around creating or helping to create economic structures that allow uh, black and brown communities to be self-sustainable. Um, COVID has given us uh, a revelation. COVID-19 has given all institutions a, a revelation and uh, Loyola University is one that um, has, has been revealed in terms of what we have in terms of resources that will allow us to find money to create those systems and structures for change. Um, it required us to build spaces on campus to do the things that we never uh, articulated that we could be done. We invested all kinds of money. We found money to do certain things on campus to meet the needs of COVID-19 is my point. Um, we need to do the same thing in Baltimore. Uh, we have a promise as our principles of uh, Ignatian spirituality, and that's care for the whole person. And that means an investment in community partners that is grounded in a substantive uh, investment for repair. And repair, I'm using in the language of reparation. And so when institutions begin to reallocate funds that, that are deeper than the symbolic gestures that we often see around, quote unquote, Black Lives Matters and the, Black Lives Matter and the signs that we put up in, in spite of all of the suffering and the violence that Black and brown communities have to endure. So rethinking and reimagining at Loyola means creating a comprehensive strategy that addresses the multifaceted inequities and disparities that exist inside of this institution and an intentional promise and an intentional pledge to create structures that will promote the economic, social, and uh, political power for self-sustaining uh, in uh, restoring and restoring uh, our communities. Um, one example is maybe one of 1,000 goals of this strategic plan that Loyola can develop to show that we are intentional about how we can begin to promote the betterment of, of our communities that Baltimore is that, that Loyola is housed in in Baltimore is create five to 100 Freddie Gray full business scholarships that are given annually to target black communities in Baltimore. Again, that's one of 1,000 goals in this strategic plan to build a better world through business that includes the opportunity of a post-grad <clears throat> MBA that leads to tenure track faculty positions. And then when you're a tenure track faculty position, your family can come to school tuition free. See, I'm talking about reparation um, and, and repair because we have to find ways to repair the rupture. And so rethinking and reimagining means that we are shifting and reallocating the funds in this institution to invest in ways that we promote the economic empowerment and sustainability of our people in Baltimore City, not from white saviorism, not creating videos that say we're going to come and save you from yourself, but we're going in and we're going to invest and we're going to create opportunities 
for our people in Baltimore City to do what needs to be done uh, to create that power structure. So my last question to everyone, and we have uh, two minutes left. So in the next minute, I'm just going to come to each person very quickly because people <clears> often <throat> wonder, you know, how do I get started on this journey? I don't want to be an activist because Adam Jackson told me that's not a good word. I don't want to take a picture of me on a protest march because Dr. Battle told me that's not a good word. I'm getting myself to church because Reverend Adams told me I need to be there. So what is one resource that you would recommend, one book or video, one thing you would say, you know what, just so you can think about it, why don't you start here? And, and I'll start myself and then I'll go to Adam Jackson. I said, go and read um, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. I think people need to go and get an understanding of the mass incarceration industrial complex and how that connects to current police, our current police state to really figure out where we're going. That's my resource. Adam Jackson, what's yours, sir? Ah, there we go. Um, my suggestion would be more generally that, uh, especially people who want to be involved locally here in Baltimore, is to be grounded in the history read about the Goon Squad, read about people like Walter P. Carter, read about Perry Mitchell, read about uh, Verna Welcome, read about all the Black people who have who've engaged in Black freedom struggle at various levels, and to seek out eldership, to seek out mentors, to seek out mentors, because um, without mentorship from the elders, uh, a lot of the problems we're doomed to repeat. And to find a Black organization that you, that you can support, that aligns, that aligns with your values, and start simple, start, start there. Thank you so much. Adam Jackson is the CEO of Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. Dr. Nishan Battle, her book is Black Girlhood, Punishment and Resistance, Reimagining Justice for Black Girls in Virginia. And she's an associate professor of criminal justice at Virginia State University. And then I'll come to you last but not least, Reverend Adams, who's right here at Loyola University, Assistant Director of Campus Men, Senior Pastor, Heritage United Church of Christ. What is your resource, sir? Oh, absolutely. I would recommend um... Ibram Kendi, or as I would say, Ibram Kendi's 400 Souls, or yeah. um, Isabel Wilkerson's cast. Thank you so much. When people heard Ibram Kendi, they thought you were going to say how to be an anti racist, and I was already going, mm, stamped 400 Souls, but they're absolutely other stamped. Four. Absolutely yes. stamped. Yes. Absolutely. So, folks, I want to thank you so much, all of our panelists, for joining us. And I want to thank all of you for watching. Please note that today's colloquium is a partnership with the Carson Institute for Race, Peace, and Social Justice, and with the Reginald F. Lewis Maryland Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture. We will have an activity with the Reginald F. Lewis Museum, which is going to be on April 28th. It's called Living While Black, a town hall discussion, and it will be Adam Jackson and I in conversation with one another. Uh, the Carson Institute is very excited to just partner with the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. The museum is named after Reginald F. Lewis, one of the first black millionaires. The Carson Institute is named after my daddy. So I love to have those two institutions coming together. And we're also in partnership with Maryland Public Television, who will host two virtual events on Thursday, May 20th and Thursday, May 27th, focusing on important conversations regarding national unrest and police brutality. Please check the Carson Institute's website for additional details. Thank you so much for joining us today. May we continue to go forward in pursuit of peace and justice. Thank you again.